there, this is Jessica Hagman at Alden Library, and we are here today live on Instagram to show you another exhibit that we have on the fifth floor of the library. And I am here today with Stacy Lavender and Carmen Beecroft, um, and I will let you um, introduce yourselves and say what you do here at the library, as you've done so many times in the past. Sure. Um, I'm Stacy. I'm the Special Collections Librarian here at Alden for our manuscript collections. And uh, for those of us who aren't as familiar with what that means, what does manuscript mean? Sure. So the the Traditionally, you think manuscript and you think handwritten, but that's not what it means in this case. Um, our manuscript collections are essentially our archival collections that are not OU history related. So it could be anything from you know Civil War, World War II collections. It could be literary figure collections. In this case, we're going to be talking about collections related to the Athens Mental Health Center. Awesome. All right, and Carmen. And I'm Carmen Beecroft. I'm the digital projects librarian here. So I primarily take Stacy's material and get it online. And do all of the associated work that yes to make it yeah. possible to see those things and to find them <clears throat> there's uh, a lot of that um, yeah that happens and this is actually um, imminently going to be um, freely available online I'm still working on it but by the end of the year um, you will be able to view all this material on your own computer awesome all right so the exhibit um, is a history of what we know as the ridges now um, so we have material, maybe we'll start over here at the beginning. So this material um, is from the opening of what was then known as the, what was it first called? The Athens Lunatic Asylum. Okay. Um, and so what do we have here at the beginning? Yeah, so I started off at the beginning talking about um, the asylum was built, um, it's a Kirkbride institution, which was a popular way of designing mental health institutions at the time, which focused on um, having beautiful grounds, giving patients access to nature, um, having buildings that allowed patients for access to you know light and open spaces, that sort of thing. Um, so there's some pictures of the interiors of the asylum and of the grounds. There's also um, on the back wall a really early plan from the asylum from I think 1872. It's in the 1872 annual report um, that shows all the, the original buildings and what the grounds looked like. And so um, you said it had like 16 different names over the course of its life yeah, to what we now know as the ridges? Yeah. Yes. Um, it changed pretty frequently, and there's a timeline across the top of the exhibit that shows, um, that Carmen put together, that shows the, the different time periods that are associated with each name. Okay. So uh, it looks like we have kind of post-Civil War, and then uh, the longest time, it looks like maybe, is the Athens State Hospital. Yeah. Um, so what's happening during that time frame? So during that time frame, you're seeing um, a meteoric rise of patient population. Um, at one point in the, in the mid-1950s, you have 1,800 patients in a building that was originally designed for about 800. Oh, my. And, you know, they are expanding their facilities as time goes by as well. Um, 1890s is also the beginning of hydrotherapy, um, which is they got really into, and it was uh, um, continuous cold baths, being stuck in a cold bathtub for hours, um, being mummified in, in cold sheets. Um, and um, there was a, a real um, belief that you could sweat out or, or wash off toxins and that would make you healthy. Um, you also have, um, starting in the 1920s and 30s, um, electroshock therapy, which was um, very frequently used. Um, there's a lot of accounts of um, them experimenting with different musical types in the waiting room to mitigate patients' fears. Um, by the 1950, um, at this point where we have low budget, high volume of patients, the community steps in a lot and starts to um, contribute their time and money and effort to provide really essential public services like ambulances. They bought an ambulance. They bought the intercom system. They bought electrical panels. They were um, doing stuff that you would really consider the, the state's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And these were mostly women in the community. Um, the Athens um, State Hospital Auxiliary was um, very active at this time period, and they would do things like take the patients shopping. Um, they would, um, you know, things that are, are often devalued as, you know, women's um, frivolous pursuits like mm -hmm. garden clubs, book clubs. Um, ways to enrich patients' lives um, when there's no line item in the budget for it. Oh, um, they did have, yeah, they did have a recreation. Is that who we see here? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you see the um, 
gray ladies um, in their Red Cross uniforms. Um, they were a volunteer organization. Um, they did um, significant fundraising every year. Um, and you can also see um, the publication of what was then the Ohio Department of Mental Hygiene and Corrections, <laughs> which was also had charge of um, state prisons, um, was um, saying that they needed, uh, what was it? Um, they needed um, $107 million to, uh, um, to retrofit um, their existing facilities and all state hospitals in the state were 12,000 patients over capacity. Um, you are also seeing, um, as Ohio University is growing, um, a significantly higher um, amount of, here we can open this up for you, um, you're seeing a lot more um, engagement in the student population and um, especially with use of the grounds. Um, it was, it very quickly got a uh, reputation as a lover's lane. Um, you can see in, um, it's literally called Lover's oh, wow. Lane here in 1943. Is this uh, someone's yearbook or what is that? Uh, that is the Peters Range books. Oh, what is that? Um, so W.E. Peters, Peters was a um, surveyor in Athens County who took photos of every section of every range um, within the county. So it's a lot of landmarks that are no longer around. But um, this uh, reputation of the grounds, which at this point were a thousand acres um, as, a, as a place to party, um, is, was um, definitely, it kind of came to a head in 1948 when the president of the university wrote to the superintendent, no sorry, when the superintendent of the hospital wrote to the president of the university and said that um, on warm days, the boys and girls both flock over here and lie around literally on top of each other with so few clothes on that in driving through the grounds, one would think it was the naked city. The conduct has become actually disgusting and repulsive. It has been reported to me by employees that students have been seen having sexual intercourse, intercourse in broad daylight in plain view of the drives and walks. Um, they build fires, and on numerous occasions they've asked them not to do this, only to be told that their fathers are taxpayers, that it's this public property, and they have the right to do anything they wish on it. And even in um, several decades later, in the 1980s, um, we're still seeing students lighting fires, um, and they accidentally caught a, a tar paper roof on fire, and they put it out with their beer, um, as you can see by this police department <laughs> memo. <laughs> in the back there, um, you know, a lot of um, um, student traditions and, um, and cultural touchstones came from the ridges, such as if we come over here, you can see um, infamous Jim Crockey, um, who was an alligator who lived in the fountain at the administration building in the late 1920s. And you can see behind it um, a photograph from perhaps the early 20th century of um, community members enjoying um, the manicured lawns and artificially created lakes on the property. So it sounds like there is a tension between like who owns mm -hmm. this space, the university or the city or the hospital, and who gets yeah. to do yeah. that. And you, you've also, nice. you know, a lot of students are doing research projects um, at the hospital. Um, students are volunteering. There's even students who lived at the hospital um, rent-free in exchange for um, labor and helping the patients um, in later years. Yeah, so there's a tension, I think, but it's also, in a lot of ways, a really sort of beautiful relationship between the institution and the community, and you can see that in the collection as well. Um, so how much um, time do you spend researching? I don't imagine all of this information comes <laughs> out of the sources. Like, how do you, like the things about, there was something you said, I can't remember now, but like the the kind of contextual research that's happening here. How, like, well, it's part yeah. of the process. Like, A lot of the research that I do is in order to provide good metadata for the digital images that we capture. Okay. So in order to be able to um, index this properly such that it can be searched or browsed upon um, and to provide some context because, you know, digital, um, Collections um, do suffer from a bit of context collapse. Everything is flattened. Um, you don't have quite the structure, so it, it's important to be able to say, you know, this is here because of this reason, um, and this is how it relates to other things in the collection. Um, one thing that we've been investing a lot of time on that Ro just showed you is the Green Hill News. We have 126 issues of wow. that that have been 
fully digitized. We're working on redacting patients' last names out of it. And these will be seen for the first time um, since they were created in the 1950s because of the last names, they're not available in person. Um, so digital um, delivery is the only way forward and um, they've been in a closed portion of the collection for decades. Wow. So we're really excited about getting that online. So yeah, they're really wonderful. They really humanize, I think, the patients. It's one of the few parts of the collection where you get to see like insight into what their daily lives were like. Mm -hmm. um, and also their own perspectives. Right. Um, the patients were writing the newsletter right. um, mm -hmm. along with staff. Um, and so there's this great um, excerpt from the 60s of patients complaining about um, slovenly long-haired attendants <laughs> and how they should be yeah. held to the same standards of dress and comportment that the patients are. For sure, yeah. Uh, so yeah, just thinking about like of the digitization in addition to the, the process, like the contextual research that has to go on here and the privacy considerations, I think those are things that are often kind of invisible from the digitization process. So I'm glad we get to talk about some of that other stuff that's happening there. Um, all right, so over here it looks like we have kind of a more recent. Yeah, um, we're, yes. we're, we're entering the end game here. This is um, the last couple of decades um, when the site, now known as the Ridges, was still a hospital. Um, as you can see, this bifurcation on the timeline, there, um, the hospital itself moves off site. It becomes much smaller. Um, and the site itself is the Ridges, um, which is still in use today, is the site of the, um, the Voinovich School, it's the Kennedy Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. Um, printing services, there's a number of university departments that um, use the buildings there. Um, in the 1980s, um, what the space was going to be used for was still up in the air. There were a bunch of uh, really interesting proposals, such as an equine park, a golf course, um, Acropolis World Gardens and Sculpture Park. Um, the One of the most uh, controversial was an early biotechnology bioengineering firm, um, which was dubbed in the letters to the editor to the Athens Messenger, the Super Hogs program. Is that the bionic? Yeah, the bionic. Yep, and nice. um, okay. the, the president's office um, did a couple of town hall meetings, um, and you can also see some talking points um, in yellow under genetic engineering notions of ways that they were trying to um, ameliorate um, people's fears about n messing with what should not be messed with. Um, and there's also fears about um, how this development um, would affect the natural resources and um, and natural beauty of the site. Mm -hmm. And of course, these are conversations we're still having, having exactly having yeah, today yeah. About yeah. literally places. still um, the same site, the same issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, the earliest building to be developed was the dairy barn um, into a dairy barn art center. Um, it was an actual working dairy farm um, until um, the. I think the early 1960s, it was the building was derelict. It was going to be demolished. Um, the Southeast Ohio um, Arts Council bought it, refurbished it, um, and got it listed as a historic place. Okay. Um, as we move into the 1970s, we see a complete change in how um, people with mental illnesses are um, given mental treatment, or sorry, given given medical treatment. Um, in the U.S. and um, campaigns such as humanization, which you can see um, in the far corner, um, a lot more emphasis on patients' rights. Um, you can't open up the visitor's guide, unfortunately, um, or the patient orientation packet. We'll get to in the digital collection, um, and that shows um, a real change in um, you know you are incarcerated here. Um, until we say you're fixed, and instead of going to a, a, um, a program of, um, of co-treatment and patient buy-in, and um, patients were given spending money, um, they were given um, their own clothing, and had the ability um, to move about much more freely. Um, it, it would, we would be remiss, however, if we didn't mention the fact that um, in the 1950s, between 1953 and 1958, um, the asylum, at that point, the state hospital, was the site of 219 lobotomies. Um, five people died of that procedure. Um, it was all the brainchild of um, this particular guy, um, Walter Freeman, who literally traveled the country in his lobotomobile, um, and that's what he called it. Um, trying to um, fix people using um, this revolutionary technique of psychosurgery. Um, 
after his theories were discredited, he couldn't, and he, he just couldn't deal with that. And so he spent the next several decades of his life um, going back to sites where he had done lobotomies and trying to prove that he had actually helped people's lives. Um, and so there, he produced um, a lot of um, debunked studies um, about um, the outcomes of his patients. Um, so what would you hope that someone who visits this takes away from the exhibit or um, what's, what you see as kind of the, I don't know, the main, not the main point, but the, uh, I mean, I think my main, ideas, I guess, is the, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, my main hope for a takeaway for people, I think, is, is mostly just that these materials are here, mm -hmm. they're really rich, um, that this is an institution that's been around for a really long time and has a really you know, fascinating history full of change. Um, and so hopefully it just sort of makes people interested in the materials and makes them want to come back and look at them in the reading room or look at them online. Yeah, I do definitely <clears throat> want to emphasize the, the connection between the university and the community um, and get people excited to do their own research. Um, and so this, you know, we've done, we've given you a little bit of an overview um, of what is available here. Um, and um, it's up to you to take the next step. Excellent ending. Um, all right, so thanks very much for telling us about that. I couldn't end it better than that. So I'll just say thank you for your time and for showing us this. And this is on the fifth floor of um, Alden Library. You can come in here um, whenever the archives is open. Um, so time frame on that is? Yeah, nine to five, Monday through Friday, and 12 to four on Saturdays during the semester. All right, so stop in next time you're here. Thanks. Yay. Yay.